Welcome to the Truth and Grace Counseling Podcast. Truth and Grace Counseling exists to provide clarity from a biblically informed perspective in order to help individuals engage life faithfully. Let's go. Welcome to episode one of the Truth and Grace Counseling Podcast. On today's episode, I give parents the secret weapon to defeating Coco Melon tyranny in your household. I also look over my favorite purchase of 2022, and I look to see if my dog is defective. You be the judge on this. In the meat section, I interview a conservative counseling graduate student and learn more about her journey. I'll meet you at the water cooler. The water cooler. This is the water cooler segment, so grab your water. This is kind of your uh, time to just sit back, relax. This is a, an intro icebreaker to the podcast, so it's kind of more funny, low-key type of things just to get us started. Uh, I, I like to bring my silly different looking cups. This is my Crayola green cup that my that my wife got me. <laughs> so first thing on the agenda, are you a parent? Do you have young kids? Do these young kids love Coco Melon? I've got a three-year-old and a one-year-old. They both love Coco Melon. And um, don't get me wrong, there's nothing bad about it in the sense like it's family friendly, that just sings songs. Um, it's okay if, um, in my mind for kids to watch it, but boy, does it get annoying after a while. The songs get caught in your head. The animation's kind of creepy. The way they walk is just weird. I get tired of it. So my wife found, did you know there's something called Pokemon TV? So we have a Nintendo Switch, and there's a free app on there on the Switch, and they also, um, I'll, I'll link down in the description, just have a website, Pokemon TV. And they have, I believe, a good chunk, if not all of the animes um, that, that you could watch. We've not used it for that purpose, but they have all of these silly cartoons, kid cartoons and uh, nursery rhymes. My son loves just listening to these uh, goofy Pokemon songs talking about colors and things like that. So if you're a parent out there, you're tired of watching Coco Melon, hey, I would say <laughs> give it a shot. Give Pokemon TV a shot. You never know. Another thing, this is just a personal thing. I actually have a show and tell here. Yeah, as you can see, this is my eye mask. So some of you may know I have uh, struggled with sleep over the last few years. I love my, my daughter so much, but as a baby, she was a terrible sleeper, really jacked with my sleeping rhythm. So I've got here my eye mask. I've noticed that when I get a head massage before I go to bed, I tend to sleep better. And what this mask does, it kind of looks like a VR headset. You, you strap it in over your your head, put it on your eyes, and it works kind of like a blood pressure cuff. Um, the, you can see over here the air will kind of fill up and, and deflate, and it massages different parts of your, of your temple and to your ear. And then what I love is kind of right here on the middle there, it's got a heating component to it. And it has really helped my sleep. It helps just improve my relaxation before I go to bed. So um, I'm definitely not a doctor. I'm not saying go out and definitely go and, and buy this, but it's helped me. Um, so I'll include a link down there if you're interested in uh, looking at an eye mask yourself. I am a huge proponent of it. It really, really helps me. Last thing I'll add on uh, kind of this water cooler segment where... Uh, you know, just bring in goofy stores. I think you see over here in the background, I've got my, uh, this is a, a little crochet thing that my sister made for me. This is of my dog, Ruby. Um, Ruby, she is a, whoa, well, Ruby fell. <laughs> Ruby is a Chesapeake Bay Retriever. Um, she, if you don't know what a Chesapeake Bay Retriever is, it's kind of like a curly Labrador Retriever. And I, I think there's a chance she's just defective. <laughs> she, uh, she's a good dog. She mostly stays outside. And um, when it got super cold here, like it did uh, and here in Oklahoma a couple weeks ago, it got into the single digits. Went outside and put a faucet protector, um, you know, to protect the pipes. And this was before it got super cold. Um, and 
she ripped off a couple different ones. Um, and not only that, but she's done this for a long time that I'll give her her water bowl outside and it won't be five seconds later. And that water bowl is spilled. And, and it's not just that she spills it. Um, she'll try to flip it up in the air. She'll, this is a big metal bowl. She'll flip it up in the air, try to catch it. Um, I've not gotten it on film yet. If I do, I, I will try to show it in a future <laughs> water cooler segment. But um, yeah, she's, she's, a, she's a strange dog. I love her. She's a great dog, but she is a strange dog. So feel free to let me know if you have any uh, kind of silly pet stories, uh, particularly dogs, but if you have, uh, have any cats or birds or whatever that you have, um, feel free to write that down in the comment section below. The meat section. Okay. Well, today I'm very excited um, having a guest on the show today. So we have Megan Hinman, who is a clinical mental health counseling student engaged in Christian counseling for veterans and court mandated counseling program participants. She is a homeschooling mother of four, was a military spouse for 10 years, and has been happily married for 15 years. She's the Office of Practice Perspective, the Transformational Process, and Social Imperative of in Inquiry and Introspection. Megan, it's great to have you on today. Yeah, thanks for having me here. Hey, well, let's just kind of start with kind of a, a, an icebreaker type of question. Tell me something interesting about yourself. Sure, yeah. Um, I have moved over 20 times in my adult life. Um, wouldn't recommend it. I think we're finally settled. But yeah, I've moved a lot. What would you say on average, and this is this is probably a tough question, but on average, what's been your average stop at, at a certain location? Um, oh, gosh, some were longer. Most were fairly short, so like four to six months. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, my both of my parents, oddly enough, they both moved often, not quite to that degree, but um, they both went to probably like nine or so schools during their um, high school, middle school. That, that That's whole time. a lot. It, it is a lot. Um, and my sister and I, we moved from about five minutes uh, across town. That, that was the only time yeah. they both said, we moved as kids, we're not moving. And they still live yeah. in the same house. That, well, I never moved as a kid. Okay. So. So but you have maybe, the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Uh, well, you know, I, I brought Megan on here today because she is um, studying to be a counselor and she's coming from a conservative perspective, which there are not too many of us out there. Uh, so tell me a little bit just about your conservative beliefs. Ha have you always been conservative and, and did you have kind of a red pill type of moment? Sure. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I grew up in a Christian conservative home. Um, I I was raised in Idaho, so it's fairly, I mean, it used to be more conservative than it is now. We've had a lot of influx from California. Yeah. But um, uh, yeah, I've always been somewhat conservative. Going to public school, I definitely was a little bit liberalized. Um, I think that's just part of the process of public school. Um, and then uh, in college, I found myself having um, inherent feminist beliefs mm. that weren't really meshing with, I, I wouldn't say I identified as a feminist, but then yeah, I would believe certain things as mm. if it was almost, you know, just the norm. So that started, um, I started questioning things and, and digging a little bit deeper. My dad did a really good job of having me try to find the bigger picture. So mm. if I am told that something is a certain way, well, why is it a certain way? Mm -hmm. Like, where does that information come from? Um, one red pill moment for me in particular was right after I turned 18, I did jury duty and it was a domestic abuse case. Um, and I got to see firsthand that the man was being held accountable for the violence that the woman initiated. Um, they were, it was a toxic, mutually abusive relationship, but he was the one that was on trial and he was the one that was going to go to prison. And not only that, I, I began to see there's no resources for men. There's no shelters when they do come forward as victims, they're shamed or not believed. And so mm. there's just, there's a lot of double standards and that has become somewhat my passion is to speak out on men's issues <laughs> because there's, there's not a lot of, there's just not a lot of people that do. Uh, 
I, I'm trying to think of what the the term would be. Uh, do, do you know what the term uh, uh, turf is? It kind of gets thrown around on yeah, the Twitter space. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that. Uh, it's almost like you're a Murph <laughs> of, <Yeah>. of some <laughs> sort. <laughs> that's funny. Okay, no, that but that's that's a really good point. That um, those are type of things that those are just givens. Like, a, yeah, of course, right. the, the kids go with with the mom. Of course, it's always right. the, the the male's fault or whatever. Um, and, and certainly, I you know, I, as a male, I think that um, we need to do a better job as a whole of leading families, trying to not get in these situations. Mm -hmm. um, but you see a lot of males that just give up. What's the point? Why should I even date? Um, right. it's just going to get me into trouble. And it's really sad. Yeah, it is sad. And it bothers me a lot that, um, my best friend growing up, we've, we're still friends, but it's, it's difficult because we have increasingly opposing views and she's a very strong minded feminist. And she's like, well, feminism is just about equality. Mm -hmm. Like then why don't, why aren't men's issues ever addressed? It's not about equality. So yeah what is it like it's the the radical idea that men and women are equal or something yeah, like that yeah that's um, what they'll say but that's not how it's implemented yeah yeah that that i think that's something on my own end of thing um I, i'm typically pretty easy going i haven't really gotten into too many you know altercations or or riffs with people too often and while that's not a bad thing i think that my default is kind of to, to just believe, to assume somebody's not trying to manipulate or whatever. Um, and that's not always the case. It's it, not always the case. Yeah. It would be nice if you could, you know, have that default, but yeah, it's not always the case. When I have, um, I have four kids, two daughters and two sons and seeing, you know, the future is female and all of these girl empowerment things. It, it bothers me because mm -hmm. men are very much left out, you know, or if they do try to be leaders or they do try to be strong, they're called toxically masculine. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I definitely want everybody to go out and live their life, you know, in the best that they possibly can. But I think we need to ensure that we're supporting both sexes. Absolutely. For sure. Yeah. That, and that's something that I've given more thoughts to. I have a, a three-year-old daughter and a one-year-old son. Um, now just being a dad of a, of a son, it's a different mentality it's a different weight that yeah that trying to to feminize boys and things like that and you know I don't, I don't expect my son to go out there at one to go hunting or anything too crazy but he likes cars and tractors yeah. and uh, i i want to kind of get him into that type of role and to embrace that masculinity that that he has and not make him feel guilty about it mm -hmm. yeah not feeling guilty for sure well testosterone's decreasing as well so it's like there's these biosocial, mm -hmm. you know, psych psychological factors. And we have a major problem. I don't know if you saw this. I, I'm blanking on what this guy's name, some director that was saying like, we need to have less like testosterone is the problem in males, something yes, along those lines. Yes, they called it like a drug. Yeah, yeah. I saw that. I, I don't know the context, but. I don't either. That's but, horrific. But but the fact that that's like a some type of somewhat mainstream idea, that that's that's just crazy. That's, yep. that is as biological as it comes. And to villainize that is, that's, that's scary that people think that right. way. Okay. So I, I know something that, that we've talked about is the difference between being conservative and voting. Uh, that, that's, that's good that, to mm -hmm. go and vote, make your voice heard, maybe even being involved in other type of political ways. Um, but it's also important, and I would argue more important, to be conservative in your lifestyle. So so what are some ways in your life that um, you try to show those conservative values? Yeah, I, I would definitely call myself conservative, um, not necessarily Republican. I, I would even say I lean more libertarian. But conservative for me is about preserving sort of the timeless truths and the utility of wisdom in the past and then being, you know, self-reliant and independent and hardworking. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was actually thinking about this a little bit more recently because I'm older going back to school. You know, I, I've supported my husband for 10 years while he was in the military. And then um, we have this opportunity now where I can pursue my career as my kids get a little bit older, but my family is still my priority. Hmm. So that has been really difficult to juggle because there's not a lot of people doing it, a lot of women doing it, and there's not a lot of accommodation. Um, when you have, especially homeschooling, like mm -hmm. if my kids were in public school or if it, you know, 
if I was more hands off, I think it'd be easier, but it's definitely difficult to juggle and navigate, but I think it's important. And as they're more independent, I'm allowed, I'm able to sort of pursue this personal development. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I really like that. Um, for, for one, the way that you're going about that, I think is very rare that even though the kiddos aren't, you know, you don't have a baby right, right there. That's mm -hmm. still where you view that that is your, your importance. And again, how sad that that is looked down upon. Um, I, I, I can't tell you how many times with my wife, like, oh, when you're going back to, to teaching or, right. um, oh, you're just staying home. Uh, you're just, just a mom. Yeah. Yeah. Just, I don't want to just be a stay at home mom. Uh, like, that's just the worst thing ever. And my wife and I have talked about this. I love my kids and I'm going to be actively involved in their lives. I will never have the impact on their lives that, that my wife will, that, that she has this role that she gets to individually shape them more than anybody else in the world and how cool is that and we make it's amazing it, yeah we make it sound like it's terrible and it's just a shame oh well, it is a shame and i've um I, i've seen both ends of it so my mom was a stay-at-home mom and i like all of my siblings there's four of us we you know understand how invaluable that is how priceless that is because even when i was growing up it wasn't all that common mm -hmm. um and then she came to a point where she's like, okay, all of my kids are gone. I don't know what to do with my time mm -hmm. in my life. And she's like, now what? You know, so there's some, sort of this crisis that people go through on the other end of it. Mm -hmm. But then if you, you know, I have some friends and, and family that um, pursued their career first. And then they're running into the problem of, well, now I can't have kids. Or it's much more mm -hmm. difficult to get pregnant. Or, you know, now they're accustomed to two incomes and they don't know how to navigate it. So there's a lot of yeah the socially we're just in such a weird place where we we really just don't prioritize the family and i think everyone suffers because of it absolutely and and again that's that's where that key is is that priority it's like it's like going working at some corporation which you know typically has been a very liberal talking point that these corporations are are evil but yeah. you're selling your life to go work at one yeah it, it just doesn't make any sense really sad yep. go serve your boss but not your family <laughs> exactly um but what would you say as far as conservative values go what what would you say is your most important conservative value um for me the most important thing is truth um you know i definitely believe in a, in a in an objective truth uh which in the postmodernist you know place that we're at right now it's more about everybody's perspective and your truth mm -hmm. and and there's not a lot of agreement on what is objective truth. So I think that's really important for us to key in on. Um, and it's gotten so bad that we can't even say there are two sexes, there's male mm -hmm. and there's female, or we can't say, you know, and people can't even say that an unborn baby is a human. So we're, we've just strayed so far from being able to speak truth that I think mm -hmm. we're all suffering because of it. Um, you can't solve problems if you can't even identify what the problems are or what the parts of the problem are. Absolutely. Um, I, I was listening to a podcast the other day. It was actually the uh, it was the Babylon B podcast. Now, now that I think about it, um, which typically isn't the most uh, you know thought provoking. It's more just my background noise type of thing. Um, but they had this guest on, and she was talking about how you know that we're we're just at such a level where truth is we just don't know where it is half the time. And, and it's really scary in that sense to have kids in this situation to where, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, no, you can just be gender fluid that that's, that's normal. Um, and that it's a constant battle to be able to inject that truth. And this is, we've been battling truth from the get go. If, if you're a Christian, then mm -hmm. you, you look at the story of Adam and Eve, the serpent, you know, that that's very postmodern type of thinking like that. They, they got really say not not to eat that. So they, right. these are not new. But in our lifetime, in our culture, this is kind of uncharted territory. What we grew up as of having at least we may disagree on what the objective truth is, but we're trying to get there. Mm -hmm. We're not playing the same game. And it's important to teach our kids to, we, we can't play that game that, that the culture's playing. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. You can't, 
you can't lie out of an attempt to be kind because it, it does more damage than good. Absolutely. And that is something that I think is just so foreign. We're so used to feeling good, uh, make, making people feel better. And I say something to where, um, no, me calling you a girl, if you're really a boy, that that's, that's actually a loving thing. And that's seen as bigotry, seen as hate. And mm -hmm. I, I'm resigned to just say, I can't change their emotions. I can't change how they feel about this. I can say what is true and what they do with it. That's, that's ultimately up to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and you really, you, it's so frustrating because if you want to help someone like, I always think about like alcoholism, for example, mm -hmm. like if you're enabling, you're just helping someone suffer and, and eventually end their life. If you want to be helpful, if you want to be kind, you have to um, acknowledge when tough love is necessary. And that doesn't mean that you can change people. That doesn't mean that you can make them do what you want or even see it from the way that you see it. But um, I think it is so important to at least, okay, for example, with the, with the transgender things, at least acknowledge, and they're, they're getting better about this, the risks of uh, the medications that you're mm -hmm. going to take or uh, the, fe the feelings may not resolve, you know? And so beginning to acknowledge that there are difficulties no matter what, so that people can face those instead of trying to escape. Yeah. Yeah. I, I hope that makes sense. No, it does. It absolutely does. And I think that's why this transgender issue specifically has hit so hard uh, many would disagree with me on this and and particularly on the conservative side of things but some of my more traditional christian thoughts towards gay marriage for instance uh, we, we've seen this and you know just recently passed with the defensive marriage type of act i disagree with that now where i try to give some uh intellectual points, I guess, is I can at least see where somebody would try to intellectualize that. And again, we come up to different conclusions. I mm -hmm. still would fight against it. No, don't get me wrong, but I can debate you on that. Right. This trans issue is so basic. It, it It is as basic as could be. This is a boy. This is a girl. And if we can't get that right, then what can we get right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know at this point. <laughs> yeah, it, it, exactly. And I think this is why this is a hill that is that is worth dying on. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, I, I have been trying to emphasize to conservative people, particularly someone like me that lives in a very red state, a very red county. Um, I mean, our elections, they tend to go like 70, 30 for the Republican candidate. Oh, it won't happen here. It, we're, we're good here. And Go to our library right now and see the books that they want your kids to check right. out. It, I remember when I was living in Oklahoma, Sharia law was on the ballot. Yeah. And yeah. that was kind of surprising at the time. It's right. We are not afforded in this lifetime. It's such a short lifetime. You're not afforded days off. You've got to right. keep engaged. And again, pivoting back into the family. And I think that's something conservatives have to get inside their heads that it's far easier and it's far more effective to work on your family first right. and then go out. But you got to get that family first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you do have to go out, there's this, um, for me, I just want to be left alone to live my life, <laughs> but yeah. you won't be able to, if you don't start participating. Nope. nope. And uh, I emphasize that too. If you're not going to be, courageous for yourself do it for your kids because mm -hmm. the, the the challenges that they're going to face we don't even know we don't mm -hmm. even know what that will look like and again speaking up saying something you have no idea who around you might be right there with you and they're waiting for somebody to be courageous along with them and yeah and again i emphasize you don't have to have a big megaphone like it it can be something as simple as saying something in the break room um and being respectful about it but but yeah, that the silent majority, that whole type of mindset, we got to work away from that. It's a losing yeah, strategy. Yeah, I agree. Yep. Absolutely. And, and kind of get, getting into just more of the, um, the, the discrimination side of things. You, you going into a counseling field that has always been more liberal leaning and now seems to just be off the rails type of liberal. Yeah. What type of discrimination have you seen? 
Okay, so this is kind of funny because I I knew in my undergraduate how, and this was 10 years ago, how um, left-leaning the field was. So I went out of my way to seek the most conservative program that I possibly could. So I, um, I chose Liberty University. Uh-huh. And I, I love it. They've been great. But the liberal, the, the, the ideologies are still there. And so if they're still there in this curriculum, like, I can only imagine how much they are in the other ones. Um, I did my research project on locus of control. That's something that's really important to me, um, which is whether you believe more in your internal locus of control, your self-directing capacity, mm-hmm. or external locus of control, more deterministic, you know, your um, the external factors direct your life. Right. And what I theorize is that the more you buy into specific ideologies like feminism or um, anti-racism or Marxism, the more you have an external locus of control. Mm-hmm. And our research has showed us that an internal locus of control uh, is correlated with higher improvement and higher recovery for countless different disorders. So I got pushback, not on the data, but on the premise. People didn't like that I was even discussing feminism in a <laughs> negative way. Or in my undergrad, I was I wrote a paper on um, the detrimental effects of pornography. Mm. I didn't like that either. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and that, I think that goes back into it exactly what you're talking about, that internal locus of control. Gosh, what I, I can't remember what the kind of the the big thing about pornography. It's something like 96% of people watch pornography and 4% lie about it. It's so, something That's like that. That's what they say. Yeah. 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 And and it's just this, well, we might as well give up on that issue. Yeah. Just, just don't do anything too bad with it. And uh, I, 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 as much as I think there is criticism of the culture of the far left type of stuff going in, I really, I am more critical on conservatives that um, endorse things like that, endorse pornography, mm-hmm. and um, it, it, honestly, even endorsing divorce and things like that. Not, not so much of if you got divorced, how can I improve things, but just no, no big deal. It's fine. It's no big deal. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's definitely standards, and that doesn't mean we all meet those standards but we're aiming right. like we can see what the best practices are we can see what we're aiming for and i think that's the big difference is are you aiming for something even if you're not meeting it or are you not aiming at all what what a big difference there and i i think we've just lost that i know in the christian world that can almost be like well i don't want to be legalist and yeah uh, don't get me wrong like the the pharisees were very legalistic that's a legitimate problem mm-hmm. but there's a difference between having your eyes set on something like you're talking about and the the pharisees is how good can i look they, they didn't care about what yeah. they what they were doing it's how they looked that's mm-hmm. a big big difference and we can't we can't lose that and and i know a lot of republicans say well if we just you know, we, we got the House back. If we just get the Senate back, if, if we elect Trump or whoever, DeSantis in 2024, we'll get back mm-hmm. on track. And that helps. Sure. I'm not saying to not go out and vote or be involved politically, but there are deeper seated issues here that one election's not right. going to win. Right. A hundred percent. There's cultural issue. It's, what did someone say? It's like the soul of the nation is at stake. It's not a political issue. The political issue is just the symptom of of Absolutely. something that's much, much deeper. Um, I always think it's about um, the balance between uh, morality and freedom. So morality has to be freely chosen. You can't force it because then you have tyranny, but you can't have enduring freedom without morality because mm-hmm. then you, you know, slide into degeneracy and it, yeah. it just, there has to be that balance, but it's hard to find. <laughs> it, it is. And, and we can look at this in basic levels. Um, think of when you're a kid, if I could just eat as many cookies as I'd want, then that would be the best thing ever. And you're then an I'd adult. Happy. It, yeah, you're an adult, you do it. And guess what? You have a tummy ache. Mm-hmm. It's these concepts are inherent. And if we just would really get out of our own way, and, and particularly if you're a Christian, where you're getting your source of truth from, um, mm-hmm. that does a lot of the battle. I, Honestly, I think a lot of times we we tend to overcomplicate things. Some of the answers yeah. are not that complicated. It, it's yeah. just, again, uh, getting our own sinful state kind of out of the way. Yep. Okay. Well, l- last, last big question here. Um, I know you're still um, working on, on graduating and everything. Still got a little bit of road ahead, but 
particularly once you get out, so you're, you're getting out on your own, how do you plan on injecting some of those conservative type of beliefs into your counseling practice? Um, so one of my, um, not mentor, like a person that I look up to, I don't know, not someone I know personally, but Thomas Sowell. Yeah. Um, so he talks a lot about the the reality and the statistics, and then he has this very pick yourself up by your bootstraps, right? Which has become an offensive term almost <laughs> right. because everybody's like, well, you have to consider all of the things that, you know, impact people. And that's, that's fair. But at the end of the day, nobody can help you more than you can help mm. yourself. So what I want to do, and I think this is kind of the root of conservatism is to empower people to change their own lives, to begin to identify and realize how powerful they actually are in exerting, you mm. know, direction over themselves and changing and growing and and discover, discovering what their values are and what they what code of ethics they want to live their life by um i think people feel very disempowered mm -hmm. and a lot of that is because of the ideologies of marxism and anti-racism and feminism where they yeah. say everything is against you so i want to push back on that and and just encourage people yeah yeah uh, uh, absolutely and and again getting back to I think some more basic concepts. We just got to get down to the root of some things. I, I was kind of thinking of something similar of that yesterday. Uh, and I just know so many people that are, yeah, they're just, their life is worthless. They don't have any direction. And then I'm outside uh, with my, with my son, who's jumping in the leaves, just happy as could be. Yeah. He's just out there living, but he's doing something. He's not sitting there on his phone. I mean, he doesn't have a phone, but uh, that freedom to just go out and, and explore. And I think mm -hmm. as adults, in part because of our culture, we're just so trapped. And sometimes we're trapped in our own head. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Especially with all of our devices and social media. And yeah, very trapped. I think um, we almost are hyper fixated on aiming towards happiness. And when you aim at it, you mm -hmm. miss it because it's a byproduct of something else. Absolutely. Yeah. And what's so interesting when, when you look over your life, sometimes those most impactful, happy, joyous, whatever moments are tied to something very difficult. My, Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. My wife, um, both of her children, she was sick all nine months, just awful. Um, but the babies were healthy. And when the babies were born, she's not sick anymore. And how joyous that was. Um, mm -hmm. And she's not even thinking about being sick because there's this beautiful little child. And that was yeah. those 18 months between the two of them were probably the roughest 18 months of her life. Worth it every single second of yeah. it. And you have to have the pain to have the joy. Yeah, you do. And it, it makes it sweeter to understand what it is without it. Absolutely. So I, I leave this conversation being, being encouraged. And, and I want everyone that's listening to this to, to, to be encouraged, not that things are great. I don't want us to, to act like things are perfect and we don't need to do anything. No, but there are people out there, there, there are counselors out there even that are, are going to be there. And, and the more that we talk, the more that we're open, um, I, we can see change right? and we can see some good change. Yeah. Okay. Well, any lasting thoughts or comments for us? Um, I think you did a great job of summing it up. Just, you know, I'd encourage people to speak more, to connect and to, um, to take part in the, in the culture in positive ways. Absolutely. Well, I have linked down in the, the description, Megan's Twitter and her rumble. She's got uh, her own channel there on rumble. So definitely check her out. And yeah, it was great having you on here and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll connect again in the future. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thank you. Today's last word is courage. Courage is a word that I think all of us have both used and have known for most of our lives. What comes to your mind when I say that word courage? I'll tell you what comes to my mind. Now, this kind of shows my... Uh, inner Nintendo nerd, if so to speak, but what comes to my mind is Link from The Legend of Zelda. 
If you've lived under a rock, you have no idea what I'm talking about, about The Legend of Zelda. In this mythology um, of this, it's a video game series on Nintendo. In this mythology, there are three Triforces. There is the Triforce of Power, the Triforce of Wisdom, and the Triforce of Courage. And the Triforce of Courage is held by our hero in the game named Link. Now, Link faces various challenges throughout all of these games, and he's really nothing special just to look at him. He's just an average-looking guy, has a sword, and picks up various items along the way. But despite all of these massive odds stacked against him, he continues to fight on, and he doesn't falter in the face of this danger. So he earns that Triforce of Courage by this fight that's in him, in him, that's this average guy that fights. And eventually he saves the world in this game and, and defeats the evil King Ganon at, at the end of most of these games. And sorry, spoiler alert, if you've never played any uh, Legend of Zelda games on that one. So you might be sitting there thinking, okay, I need to show courage, so I need to go out and save the world, right? Well... You, you don't have to pick up the sword quite like our friend Link does. Uh, we, 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 don't all, we all don't have to save the entire world in order to show courage. For you to show courage, maybe that means you um, speak up to a coworker that's talking about, let's say, gender ideology. Maybe they're forcing people to use pronouns at work and you say, no, I'm not going to use my pronouns. I'm not going to force other people to use their pronouns. Uh, maybe that means you show the courage to show back up to church. You know you have this faith in God and you've not been faithful to to show up to church in a while. Maybe that's your courage. Maybe it's showing courage by getting on your hands and knees and, and praying to God and, and, and saying that I don't have it all figured out. I need your help. Maybe you show courage just by showing up to work every single day and standing up for truth. I can't tell you which way you need to show up for courage. I can't do that. That's your life. What I can tell you is you have to do something. You cannot show courage, particularly in this day and time, by sitting back and doing nothing. Simply liking the right tweets, liking the right Facebook post, it's not good enough. You need to do something. And don't try to figure out the perfect something. Just do something. Do it today. Do it right now. Feel free to write down in the comment section or, or write me an email of what your next step could be. What What is your form of courage? I'll tell you for me, my big form of courage that I've shown this year is my by making truth and grace counseling. Um, this is out of my comfort zone to make videos like this and, and to be quite, quite as open um, about my political and religious beliefs out in an online format like this. But I know it's important. And I, I know it's important for me to stand up for what I believe in and for other people to hear that and have that courage as well. So what's your courage? What's a way that you can show courage today, this week, this year? Let me know. I would love to hear from you. So that's going to wrap up the first episode of the Truth and Grace Counseling Podcast. I hope this is the first of many, many podcast episodes along the way. If you're interested in knowing more about me or my practice, Truth and Grace Counseling, feel free to visit truthandgracecounseling.com. Got that listed down below. If you live in Oklahoma or Texas and you are interested in starting therapy with me, again, you can visit truthandgracecounseling.com and I actually have a free consultation link listed down below and you are more than welcome to sign up for that free consultation. I am very honored to be here talking with you today. Um, I am just so gracious for all the support that I've received. And, you know, if you're listening to this, you kind of hate listening and hate watching. Hey, let me know what you hate about me, what you hate about my practice, too. Um, I'm, I'm always looking for feedback, even kind of that ugly negative feedback. All right. With that, you guys take care.